This is definitely a podcast that I could not wait to bring to you guys as listeners. So without any further delay, let's cut right to my conversation with the one and only Jesse Itzler. My man, Jesse Itzler. Hey, buddy, welcome to the Success 101 podcast. How are you today? Good. How you doing, Jared? Man, I'm great. I'm excited you're here. I mean, there are so many different facets of your life that we can learn from. And, and I knew I wanted to get you on for my listeners for that reason. And, you know, different conversations that we can have around what you've done, both in the, I guess, the world of fitness, for lack of better words, but then also primarily in your business where you're, you know, where your starting uh, roots were. And I know you started out as a Rapper, I always love hearing your story about how that starts. Can you share with my listeners just all the way back to your your humble beginnings and uh, and where you started in the music world? Yeah, I mean, I started out right at in college working on trying to make a demo. I graduated in 1990 from college when I had no prior experience in being in a studio or I didn't play an instrument and I'm not a good singer, which is not a good recipe if you want to be in the music business. If you can't sing, you've never been in a studio and you don't play an instrument. So I literally recorded my demo by taking instrumentals, playing them on a CD, and then recording songs on my answering machine. It was like the only way I could do it. And I would just call around various producers and people in the music business, label heads. If they answered the phone, I would hang up. But if I got their answering machine, I would leave their message, hoping they would call to hear to get my answering machine. I would never answer my phone and hear my quote unquote demo. That didn't work. <laughs> But I did catch the eye of a producer and I did a demo and ended up um, through a string of events getting a record deal with a small independent label called Delicious Vinyl, who had two artists at the time. One was a man named Tone Loke, who had a song called Wild Thing and Funky. Oh, yeah. You know, and the other was Young MC, who had a song called Bust a Move that just won a Grammy. So the timing was right for this label. I sent out about a hundred demo tapes to label executives on uh, CEOs and anyone in the music business that I could get an address on. And of course I got zero responses. So I was kind of used to rejection, but one day when I was in the studio in New York in Corona Queens, where I was working, I would ride my bike about 15 miles on Northern Boulevard to Corona from Long Island. And um, the only time I could get in the studio was between two in the morning and five. So one night late, I get there and there was a cassette on the desk on the uh, music board of a, a, one of my favorite artists, a rap pioneer named da Dana Dane. It was an advanced copy of his second album. You know, I, I'm a huge Dana fan. So I asked the engineer if I could kind of borrow the cassette. I would bring it back, but I wanted to take a listen. I took it. And um, on my way to California, I was going to listen to it in my Walkman on a trip I had that week. <laughs> I read that the owner of Delicious Vinyl loved his favorite artist was Dana Dane. So when I landed, I cold called them and just through some massive confusion, I think it was Harry Truman had a line, if you can't convince them, confuse them. I, the, the secretary who I was chatting with, trying to explain that I had Dana's advanced tape and Mike's a fan, I wanted to play it for the owner, Mike Ross. And she put me on hold and came back and said, Dana, if you can be here at two o'clock, Mike would love to see you. So I said, uh, I'll be there. And I buzzed myself in as Dana Dane. And they put me in Mike's office. He walked in and he was very confused. He's like, who are you? And I said, you know, I, I work with Dana. I have his cassette. And Dana's not here. But while we're waiting for Dana, can I play my demo? Blah, 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 blah. I confused him too. And then I played my cassette. I had a song called College Girls and got a record deal. So Jesse, had you ever done anything like that before? I mean, that took a tremendous amount of guts, I mean, to do that. Uh, well, you know, I really wasn't concerned about the consequences. I just, I didn't have, I graduated from college. I worked as a kiddie pool attendant <laughs> as my first job out of college because that was the only job that started the pool didn't open until 10. So it allowed me to go to the studio late and get a little bit of sleep. I didn't have a B plan on my resume. You know, I didn't have a big resume. This is what I wanted to do. So no matter what, the worst thing I figured that could happen is they don't let me in. I've already had a hundred rejection letters, basically. So, you know, the consequences were insignificant, irrelevant to me. Have you ever shared that story with Dana Dane? I mean, I'm sure, I don't know if you guys have ever connected, but I mean, is he well aware he of actually it? Became, he actually became a good friend of mine, was at my wedding. Oh, wow. And, uh, he knows the story well. <laughs> That's really cool. So your transition from music into 
Marky Jets, which I think was your your next step there, if I'm not wrong. How did that all come about? How did that, I mean, that's a pretty big stepping stone there, a big difference there. How did you go in that direction? Well, I was in the music business for a couple of years as an artist. I moved back to New York after I didn't get picked up to do a second album. I transitioned into sports music. I started writing theme songs and jingles for professional sports teams and actually had created a business out of that. I was kind of the only one doing it. So unlike, you know, walking into the record stores when they had record stores and having my album out there competing against, you know, thousands of copies, I was the only guy doing theme songs for teams and built a business out of it, sold it to a public company called SFX. And the owner of SFX had, took a liking to my partner and I and had a timeshare on a private jet. And one day he invited my partner and I onto the plane and it was like, you know, in the Wizard of Oz when everything goes from black and white to color. I was like, whoa, people fly like this? This is crazy. Sure. How do we do this? So as soon as we got off, we're like, we got to figure out how we can do this more often. Like, this is unbelievable. So, you know, we did a lot of a deep dive into kind of private aviation. And there were only three ways to do it. Buy your own airplane, which was crazy expensive. Buy a fraction of a plane, crazy expensive or charter an airplane, and there are all kinds of inconsistencies and concerns around charter. So we said, look, we're taking a couple of trips a year. We, we want to take with our family or friends. There's got to be a better way. We, we don't want to make such a big commitment. We want to take three trips. So we came up with this idea, which ultimately became Marquee Jet, for almost like a Starbucks card, a debit card for jet hours, where you would have all the benefits of owning your own plane with none of the responsibility. So on 10 hours or less notice, you could call up, get your plane, fly, let's say, two hours from Miami to New York or whatever, and you know you prepay for 25 hours, and you'd have 23 hours left. So it was like hassle-free. It was it became a private aviation. It made it more affordable to way more people, and um, it was a good way to put your big toe into this world of private jets. Was anything like that going on at that time as far as your, you know, the, like the prepaid service and the card and all of that? Mm, you know, not really. Not really. People had dabbled in it, but not really. And we were lucky enough to partner with a company called NetJet. So we were piggybacking off of their fleet and their infrastructure. And they were a Berkshire Hathaway owned company with hundreds of planes. Yeah. An amazing safety record. So we were selling 25 hours on the NetJet fleet and uh, exclusively. Awesome. That is, and the thing I love about you, man, and the thing that really got me, uh, my interest turned to you even before I read your book, which we're going to dive into here in just a second, was how you just create, you create something out of nothing, which is very unique. I mean, you hear that thrown around in the business world all the time, how people can create something out of nothing. But then you look into their story and it's like, well, maybe they had some, you know, super strong connections here, or some money here. It's, I know from your story, you really, you really do create stuff out of nothing. I mean, you, you were in the music business and had to make that happen. That didn't work out. Went into the jingles thing, as you mentioned, which at that point, I'm just wondering if you're thinking like, okay, you know, I got, got signed to a record deal. Everything's going to be smooth sailing from now on. When that doesn't work out, you're a little bit defeated more than likely. I'm speaking for you here. The jingle thing, it's like, okay, that's a different route, but it's still in the music world. And then bam, you shift over into the the whole Jets thing and find a way to make that work, doing something that other people just aren't doing at that time. And so I, you know, I love that. What I know you've got a story. I think it's even uh, maybe with 50 Cent, I heard where he was a maybe a passenger on one of those jets. And you were talking about just being grateful and giving back to people because you never know when that's going to turn around. Does that ring a bell? The story yeah. that I'm. Well, I think a couple of things. First of all, I think that for me, as I look back on, you know, I've been in multiple businesses, the music business, private aviation, uh, Zico Coconut Water, which we sold to Coca-Cola. And looking back on it, you know, the common theme for me was always that I had no prior experience in any of those businesses. And many times that could be a deterrent, like, wow, I, have a, I want to start a restaurant company. Someone might say, I want to be in the apparel business, but I don't know anything about apparel. I don't know anything about the restaurant world. So I'm not going to do that. That's, I don't, that's not my background. I went to school for the arts or whatever. So it's, a lot of times not having experience deters you from going after your passion or whatever. For me, it was the biggest blessing because it guaranteed that everything that I was going to do would be different than what was done in the past. The program would be different, the advertising, the creative, the thought. So everything. So for me, not having any background in music, not having any idea 
about the private aviation world or the business of that was a gift, you know, because we got to customize the program around really make it really customer focused, like take a good look at what we would want as a customer and then offer it up to others. So, you know, and as it relates to 50 Cent, you know, yeah, I mean, I think Listen, in your 20s and 30s, there's a great quote. I forgot. Uh, someone told me, you know, you don't have to be the smart. Only one person is going to be the smartest, but anyone can be the nicest. In your 20s and 30s, as you come up and you try different businesses and you're just trying to explore like what your passion is and, you know, what do you want to do with your life? You meet a ton of people. And those people in the 20, in your 20s, when you're 30 and 40, are off, often in positions of power. So... You know, I remember when I first started writing songs for the NBA in 1991 or 92, Adam Silver was just coming to the league and now he's the commissioner. So people, you know, obviously, as you get older and more talented, you're going to get into these amazing positions. So keeping those relationships, keeping the network, your network wide and staying in touch is just such an important thing because you never know. 50 Cent was an example. 50 was my intern. Before he was 50, he was Curtis. He was a boxer. Right. And through the DJ for Run DMC, Jam Master Jay, who shared an office and a desk with me at the time. And he said, I have this kid, you know, he wants to get in the music business, super talented. And, he, you know, he needs something for the summer. And I, I said, sure, come on up. And, you know, he actually had a partner who was amazing, who I signed. And of course, I was like, yeah, 50. It's this other kid, k Sons, unbelievable. You know, so I'm a terrible A&R guy because uh, <laughs> obviously 50 went on to have his career and, you know, k wasn't as, as wasn't as lucky. Well, it, it came back full circle for me with 50 because later in life when I started Marquee Jet, every day we would get a manifest of who was flying on the planes. And I saw that 50 was a, a guest on one of our airplanes and I hadn't spoken to him in years. This is years after he worked with me, uh, with us. So I had the pilots put a note on the plane saying, 50, this is Jesse Itzler. You're never going to believe this, but uh, you're on one of our airplanes. We started this company called Marquee Jet and we had this whole fleet, blah, 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 blah. And I left him a bottle of champagne or something with the note. And he lost his mind. He couldn't believe it because we worked at a small office in the music business years ago. And he ended up doing a super cool thing. He wrote in his rider that he would only fly with Marquee Jet. So for a while, he was uh, he returned the favor and it was just a great lesson in loyalty and a great lesson in relationships. And it really was uh, said a lot about him. And it was a good lesson, powerful lesson for me, too. Just you never know. Right. Treat people well. You just never know who's going to be who, what's going to be what. And and a lot of times things like that, those lessons surface in really unique ways. And that was, that was a great lesson for me. You know, you mentioned the the Jets, you mentioned Zico. I know you also are part owner of the Hawks now. Very curious about that, how, you know, obviously I think through your time in the NBA, that's where that spawned from, maybe some relationships there. How long have you been part owner of the Hawks? So we've been, we, as an ownership group, we've uh, been owners for about a year and a half now. We closed in June of 2015. And yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I live in Atlanta full time. And I was a season ticket holder and fan prior. So to be a part of the organization and I grew so close to the staff and the faculty and the players um, that just to be a part of it now on the inside, it's just been so fun. I'm a big basketball fan. So I've, I've loved it. I know owning a team as a business is so much harder than just going to a game. I mean, what keeps it fun for you? What, you know, so many people enjoy doing things and then they go say, hey, you know what? This is my passion. I'm going to go do it as a full time business. And then it becomes work, right? It becomes a business and they get burned yeah. out by it. What keeps it fun for you? What keeps it fun is, you know, I was a big fan first and now I'm rooting a little bit even harder. It's just everything is times 10. You know, you take the losses a li- losses become a little tougher and wins become a little sweeter. And, you know, as someone that grew up around team sports my whole life, and again, as a big basketball fan, just to follow for 80 plus game, 80 plus nights a year, I know that I can come home, put on my TV or go to the arena and just shut everything else off and just be in this world. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit of therapy on, on one 
sense and just super fun. You know, just to have a rooting interest on that level is a lot of fun. That's awesome. And frustrating. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, part of that's got to be, you know, you said take the losses a lot harder. I mean, you're looking at things yeah. so through such a different lens than I'm sure you were before. Yeah. So that takes us up to this point. You and Sarah, for those out there who are listening that don't know, Sarah Blakely is uh owner of Spanx. I think she started Spanx uh, back in the day. I don't know if she did that solo or if she did that with a partner, but how long have you guys been married now? Uh, we've been married for eight years. Eight years with four kiddos. I, I was amazed to hear that because I know reading through the book, you just had one, you had your son. And uh, right. and, and I started hearing more and more lately about the four. I was like, man, where did where all these kiddos come from? So I've got three daughters myself. Uh, at one point, everybody was under the age of three. So three under the age of three years are all right there, really close together as well. So I would love to know how you and Sarah met and how that started for you guys. Yeah, I mean, Sarah was a customer at Marquee Jet, and we were having a customer appreciation event in Las Vegas, a poker tournament, actually. And it was, we had, I think at the time, we had close to 4,000 customers, and we were only allowed to, we only got 40 invitations. NetJet's got the balance. So each rep had to send in suggestions in their territory of, of you know, Marquee Jet cardholders that they would want to come. And the Georgia rep sent in, uh, sent me an email with Sarah's picture and a little bio. I saw the picture and I emailed her back. I'm like, please make sure she comes. <laughs> you know, we met there and we became friendly and married a year and a half later. That's awesome. I, and I think I even heard that you had mentioned uh, one of the ways you got in was you're going to say you're going to run 100 miles in Spain. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that, that was part of it. I was doing a 100 mile race. And after Sarah and I met, I called up. I had to stay on her radar screen, you know, so sure. I, I called up uh, her PR gal and I said, listen, I'm running uh, this hundred mile race and I'm taking corporate sponsors and I'm happy to run it in Spanx. If, you know, if Sarah would, would be a sponsor or whatever, or make a donation. And um, she put me on hold. She told Sarah that another lunatic was on the line. And, you know, she married that lunatic a year later. Yeah, it's amazing she took you seriously. Or she just thought you'd look really good uh, running yeah, a hundred miles in space. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so, Jesse, let's shift to the book here. Obviously, one of my favorite books and why I wanted to have you on, uh, not to mention all the other things that you've done in business and in life, but just phenomenal book for those of you out there who have not checked out Living with a Seal. You've got to go pick it up. There's just so many funny stories and so many life lessons in there. Jesse, tell me about the beginnings of the book and how you first interacted with Seal or how that all started with your relationship with him. Sure. Well, I, you know, I never set out to write this book. I was at a relay race in San Diego with four friends, four or five friends. And the way the race was structured was uh, the format. I would run a mile. You would run a mile. He would run a mile. I would run a, whatever team ran the most miles in 24 hours won the race. And at the start of the race, there was a guy to my left who had no one to relay with. He was his own relay team. And the race was self-supported, so you had to bring all your own supplies. They provided nothing, no water, nothing. It was on a one-mile, dirt, unlit parking lot in San Diego. And I was coming off the sale of Marquee Jet, so I definitely overdid our allocations. We had, I had bananas, a truck pulled up with, you know, <laughs> The whole deal. And this guy who was running the race by himself had three items, one bottle of water, a folding chair and a box of crackers. And I just remember like noting to myself, like, wow, how in the world is this guy going to run the whole race with that? And he was a big guy. He was about 285 pounds. So that also was surprising. And that's not that's probably the opposite of where you want to be if you're going to run for 24 hours. Right. Most guys are like 140, 150. So at mile 70, sure enough, because of his weight, he had literally ran his feet to death. He crushed all the small bones and both of his feet literally were broken. And because he had only eaten crackers and a little bit of water, he had kidney, uh, kidney failure, kidney damage. And he was, he was literally sitting in his chair with broken bones in both feet, urinating blood. And like my immediate reaction was, I mean, we got to get this guy a medic immediately. Like we have to airlift him out of here and get him some attention like ASAP. And what did he do? He sat down, basically duct taped his feet, got out of his chair and ran another 30 miles to get to his goal of 100 miles and then ran one more in the event that they miscounted. 
<laughs> and I was like, I was so freaked out. I was like, man, what, whatever got this guy out of his chair to finish this race, whatever that drive was, whatever that grit or resilience or whatever it was that made a guy like this tick, if a little bit of that rubbed off on me, then all the buckets in my life, my work, my relationship with my wife, my kids, my personal training, everything would be better. So I Googled him and I learned that he was a Navy SEAL with an amazing backstory, fascinating story. I cold called him and I flew out to meet with him. He lived in San Diego. I lived in New York. And five minutes into our conversation, I realized that what he had would not come across in just a quick little interview or conversation or lunch meeting. And I asked him to come live with me for 30 days and with my family and I. So you didn't go out there seeking out, bringing him back no. home. You, you just wanted to go pick his brain. I wanted to pick his brain. I wanted to meet him. I thought maybe there would be, I could help him business-wise. He had a lot of star power around him, just amazing presence. His story was incredible. Um, I just wanted to meet him. And I, I, he said to me, look, he said, look, if you're crazy enough to ask a guy like me, and he is out there, to come and live with you, I'm crazy enough to come. And, you know, shortly thereafter, he was um, at our breakfast table. Just knowing what I know about him now, and by the way, his name is David Goggins. For those of you guys listening out there, if you want to go look him up and, and research his story, because I know you just called him Seal in the book, but it's David Goggins. And from what I know about him now, from reading his story and seeing him on other things, he is such a no-nonsense type of guy. I'm shocked he even took you up on the offer to fly across the country and go spend 30 days with your family. What do you think his motivation was behind that for agreeing to do it? Well, I think for him, it was he'd been in the military. He was active still when I met him. I think it was an opportunity to live with two entrepreneurs and just see a little bit as his career was coming to an end, uh, learn a little bit about life after the military and get an inside glimpse, maybe get some tips from my wife on being an entrepreneur or whatever. But I also just thought it was so out of the box and he's such an out of the box guy. It was so non-traditional and he has lived his life very non-traditionally that he decided to do it. And maybe I was a good salesman, but, you know, he, he agreed. And I know his stipulation was you do everything I say or I'm out of here. And I don't know if when he first told you that you really believed that that was going to be the case, but obviously it played out that way in the book. Well, he is a no nonsense guy, as you mentioned, I would no nonsense times three. And he did say to me, listen, I'll come but one condition. You have to do everything I say. And he put me through a series of really unorthodox things. And at first I didn't get it. So at first I was like, what's the point of this? This doesn't, and I was frustrated. I wanted to stop things like, I mean, there were a lot of physical things, running, push-ups, things like this, but a lot of mental stuff. We jumped into a, one day there was a, I lived in Connecticut at the time and the lake that we lived on was completely frozen. Kids were playing hockey on it. And after a long run, he came and took a boulder, went to the middle of the lake, banged the boulder against the ice until the ice cracked and jumped in <laughs> and then signaled for me to jump in with him. And I just remember very clearly as a kid in Long Island, my mother telling me in the winter, don't go anywhere near ice. You could fall in. You know, this was like a main point of reference, like don't go near frozen lakes. And this guy's like bathing in it. And um, so I, I did go in and immediately got out and, you know, it was freezing and my wife watched this and we ran up to get inside before we got hypothermia or frostbite and we're running up this hill to get inside in the snow. And my wife's looking out the window and when we came into the house, she was livid and she looked at Goggins and she said, Goggins, what's the medical benefit of jumping into a frozen lake? And he looked at her dead in the eye and he said, you know, this is the single most important thing that your husband asked me to come teach him. And that's mental toughness, you know, your mindset. Wow. And I didn't realize it at first, but that's really what I was seeking in all those buckets. You know, my work bucket, how am I mentally tough? Can I take rejection? Can I keep going when everyone says this can't be done? Or if my quota to sell something is 20, how do I, is that really my quota? Is that my limit? Could I sell 40? Could I double my number? You know, my son is crying because he wants a toy. Am I mentally tough enough to 
not react with stop yelling at me. Uh, am I mentally tough enough to take a deep breath? And say to myself, I've already jumped into a frozen lake. Do you think this little toy or whatever you want, you're, it's not going to phase me and calmly approach the situation. So I realized that it wasn't how many pushups I could do or some of the other things he was guiding me uh, towards. It was all about my mind and how I was approaching things and creating an environment of when things get hard, when things are tough, when you want to quit that you won't stop. And that's true of business. You know, how many times have we heard people say, well, I was going to quit. And then when I kept going, that's when I got the deal. That's when I had my breakthrough. And others, probably 99.9% quit. So he gave me kind of day in and day out this, if it doesn't suck, we don't do it attitude to create this pattern in my head that when things are hard, we attack it. We don't run from it. And I think he would even make you work out at some point in your business clothes, if I remember correctly, in the book. He had a very uh, unusual approach towards time. So for him, work at, working out, workouts, it was, it, it's cumulative. So a lot of us approach our workouts like, all right, I'm going to go walk for 30 minutes or go take a 40-minute a run or whatever, and that's my workout for the day, where he was looking at it like, if I can get 10 minutes in here rather than sitting on the couch... And then 20 minutes later in between, you know, TV shows or whatever, that's 30 minutes. So he was constantly maximizing the 24 hours in a day and approaching things as, as, as if they were cumulative over the course of a day. So it wasn't really how many pushups could you do at once? How many pages could you read now? How many emails can you do in the next 10 minutes? It was like, how many can we get across if we maximize the day? And was there ever a point where you were like, man, no way, I'm not doing that? I think at one point, didn't he have you take your 18 months? I think your son was 18 months old at that time. Had you take him out in freezing weather and run because Sarah was gone? He did. I mean, he did. He pushed the envelope. There were a lot of times that I wanted to quit. Again, that one rule of do everything I say or I'm going home. And I would constantly remind myself, like, you know, this is a guy that's dedicated his life for our freedom, that's been through way worse scenarios, situations than what we were dealing with on any given day. How in the world could I not complete what he asked me to do over the course of 30 days? So that was a constant theme in my head and a motivator. And I just didn't want to let him down. You know, one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself when you're struggling is to partner up with somebody that's incredibly driven or it, whether that's in business or you want to go work out. I mean, it's a lot harder to tell someone I'm not doing it today as it is to tell yourself, eh, I'm just going to go sit on the couch. Well, he was on a constant quest to get better. He introduced a lot of things that were uh, quite unusual to me. For example, I remember one day, uh, and this is all in, in the book, Living with the Seal, but I remember one day coming home and walking by his room. He lived, we lived in an apartment in New York City. So we were kind of, it was kind of tight. And I remember walking by his room and hearing this at night, this crazy sound, like I had no idea what it was. And I walked in and he had moved all the furniture basically out of the room against the wall and was blowing up a tent in our apartment to sleep in a tent. And I asked him what he was doing. And he said he was, you know, he's making this tent. He's going to sleep in the tent. And I asked him why. And it was an oxygen deprivation tent that takes your blood, your red blood cells or whatever, gives you, basically simulates like the top of Mount Everest. And, um, you know, he was always doing things to just make things super hard. One of the first things he made me do was sleep in a chair. He said, you've been sleeping in a bed for 47 years. You're too comfortable. You know, it's time to mix it up. It's start, we're starting right now. Go grab a wood chair. And I grabbed my chair from my desk. He threw a blanket at me and he said, you know, we're starting now. You got to change the way you change your mind. Every day there was a, he threw something new at me that was, again, didn't really get it at first, but more challenging than the day before. One day we went into my steam room after working out and, you know, this is the winter. It was freezing. We go in the steam, he jacks it up to around 120. 120 was what was indicated, but it was probably more like, it felt like 150 because it was a small steam room and it was just, crazy. And he said, we're going to stay in here for, I think he said 30 minutes or something. 
and with eight ounces of water. So I said, all right. So we go in and first couple of minutes, everything is fine. Oh, and he made me sit on my hands. So I didn't, because heat rises, he wanted me to make sure I sat up. So I wasn't sloshing down. So I had maximum, maximum heat. <laughs> nice. So I'm sitting on my hands. The steam is hitting me. Like, I feel like I'm on an iron and after the first couple of minutes, I'm okay. But 10 minutes in, I've, I've already consumed all the water. He hasn't taken one sip. I'm going crazy trying to like, I'm looking at the clock, trying to get, figure out how I'm going to make it. He's literally whistling Dixie. It's driving me nuts. And finally I said to him after like 19 minutes, I'm like, I got to get out. He said, we're not done. I said, no, I'm done. I have to get out. I'm, I think I'm going to pass out. And uh, he said, all right, well, take, take 30 seconds then if you have to. So he opened up the door. He never let, would give me 30 seconds. So I guess he sensed something really was wrong in my voice. Steam comes out like, I mean, it flies out of the door. It's like, whoosh, all the steam comes out. I sit in the chair and I do not feel good at all. I'm spinning. I'm, my, I'm lightheaded. And he looks at me. He's like, you okay? And I'm like, I'm really not okay. And he grabs kind of my ears and looks at my face. And he goes, oh, man, we got to abort. He goes, we got to abort. This is, you can't go back in there. So I said, all right, we got to abort. Please abort, abort. So he, he knew, he knew you were at your limit. Cause I don't think he had let you off the hook on anything before then. That was pretty much the only thing he let me off the hook on. And I, I could tell that he knew I was drifting into La La Land. And, you know, I, I really wasn't even sweating at that point. I was just kind of just pale and cold, you know, coming out of this crazy hot steam for so long with no water. So he knew I wasn't right. So he immediately got me some, got me hydrated. And then I think 30 minutes later, we were back at some other madness. So I know that he, you know, a lot of your comments in the book have to do with him just shaking up your life, shaking up your routine. And you really need somebody in your life that's a no nonsense type guy like that. I love the, uh, the quote that I saw in the book that whenever he first came in and you said, make yourself at home. How did he respond to that? I know he said, I don't operate in expression. He said, no, it's just an expression. And he said, yeah. no, I don't operate in expressions. Right. He came into my house at first and I said, you know, hey, Goggins, man, you know, make yourself at home. My home is your home. And he said, not nah, this is your home. I don't have a home. I said, no, make yourself at home is an expression. And he, he walked right over to my face. I mean, this is one minute into our meeting. And he said, I don't operate in expressions. And I said, OK, it's going to be an interesting month. Yeah. And then I know he had you, I think one of the first things you said he had you do was go down and, and do the pull-ups. And that's really where you learned about the 40% rule, which I'd love to dive into a little bit because that has such applications for all of us out there. When we think the gas tank is, is done and it's not, you weren't a pull-up guy. And here's a guy that I think he set Guinness Book of World Records, right? For pull-ups. Was that before or after you guys got together? After he had did 4,030 pull-ups in 17 hours. Yeah, this is so, just the type of guy he is. So the first thing he had you do was go downstairs, a guy who admittedly doesn't do pull-ups very well or didn't back then. Take us through that first exercise of where your introduction was to what you're kind of in for at this point. Well, when he first arrived, he wanted to kind of gauge where I was at physically. So the best indicator of strength was to see how many pull-ups I could do. So we went down to the gym and he said, all right, get up on the bar and let me see how many you can do. And I am not strong at all. I got maybe like eight, maybe. He said, all right, drop down and wait 30 seconds and try it again. So I waited 30 seconds, got up on the bar again and did maybe like five, I don't know, struggling five, kicking my legs, drop down and said, all right, wait 30 seconds and do it again. So I waited 30 seconds, got up to the bar and I got maybe two or three. And now my arms, biceps are just killing me. I dropped down. I said, all right, well, what do you want to do next? He said, well, we're not going to leave here, this station, until you do 100 more pull-ups. I said, come on, man. That's maybe in seal land. Right. But, like, I can't, I can't physically do it. And he said to me, you know, you really – I already know what your biggest problem is, and I, I bet it's, it's in all areas of your life, and that's that the limitations you're putting on yourself are self-imposed. And he said, I'm going to prove to you right now that you have so much more – in your reserve tank. So one by one, I ended up doing a hundred. And I said to myself, God, if, if I'm under indexing, leaving that much on the table, a hundred pull-ups in a workout, what other areas am I under indexing in and not going to my full potential? So he had a rule that he called the 40% rule. And I think it might be common amongst the military or the Navy SEALs. I'm not sure it was his or not, but 
And that was when your brain says you're done, you're really only 40% done. That we all have this amazing ability to dig inside and pull more out of us. So, you know, the way our brains are wired, the first inclination of pain or discomfort, we get a little tap on the shoulder and our brain tells us to stop because our brain doesn't want us to get hurt. So it tells us to stop. But when we ignore that tap on the shoulder, and you see it with marathon runners all the time when they hit the wall, they ignore that little tap on the shoulder to stop. When you ignore that tap on the shoulder, you have so much more, probably 60% more in you. So he proved it to me right there. And throughout our journey, uh, he continued to prove through example that I was capable of doing so much more and I was leaving so much on the table. And I think that's huge that he had to prove that to you. Otherwise, you're going to think this guy's just, you know, full of crap or whatever. But he walked you through that and made, you know, somebody tells me like, hey, man, there's 60 percent left in the tank, just as you did with the pull ups. You're like, nah, it's not like we can say that, but it's not. He made you prove that getting you up at all times of the night when you guys had had a pretty tough workout that day and telling you at 2 a.m. or whatever, like, hey, come on, we're like we're going and running through the streets and doing all the stuff that you guys did. And I think, didn't he have a heart condition as well? I hope I'm not making that up. I think I'd read that he had a heart condition. He He went through, so he was, uh, he had an amazing story. Like I said, he grew up in Brazil, Indiana. um, One of, you know, a handful of African-American families in this town. Had a really tough upbringing uh, because of that and lost a lot of his self-esteem. So he gained a lot of weight. And before he joined the military, he actually lost 100 pounds in 60 days before he reported to Buds, you know, on his quest to become a SEAL. He became a Navy SEAL, became this amazing endurance athlete. Like I said, he's broken the Guinness Book of World Records for pull-ups. He's done numerous ultra marathons, incredible distances. And he discovered after that he actually had a heart condition and he was doing it with a large percentage of his heart capacity not available. Wow. So he had accomplished all these amazing tasks literally at an incredible disadvantage without knowing it. So it just shows you how unbelievable the mind is. This guy has, and I I highly encourage anybody that's listening to follow I am David Goggins on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. I am David Goggins and learn about him because, you know, I believe that mental toughness is something that can be taught. It's like a muscle it has to be exercised. You have to constantly do things you don't want to do. And that can be, you say yes to a wedding and all of a sudden you, you wake up and you don't want to get on a plane and go to an out of town wedding. You go anyway, you do the things you don't want to do because it basically is just exercising this muscle of, I will not stop. And he has mastered that. He is my Obi-Wan Kenobi. And so I encourage anyone to check him out and just watch and see what he does forward and learn from what he's done in the past. Do you think that's the biggest thing he taught you? I mean, it sounds like that's coming through is just the mental aspect of it. For sure. Because listen, when he came and lived with me, I was doing 22, I could do 22 push-ups. When he left, I was doing a thousand a day. He knocked one minute off of my pace per mile as a runner. That's incredible. It's just basically fascinating what he was able to do to me in such a short period of time. And it all stemmed from my attitude, my approach, and my ability to overcome pain and discomfort to accomplish a goal. And I think that that is teachable. And I think that that's my biggest takeaway, my biggest takeaway. And I still hear him whispering in my ear. I still apply it, like I said, to work, to my relationship with my wife is to be present, the patience and the understanding of like, we, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to work my way through things, but I'm going to ultimately get to the finish line, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the consequences by staying with it. And he's just a mentally focused guy. You guys who go out and get the book will read more about this, but I know he showed up for 30 days at your house with like a knapsack or something, right? Was like, I mean, he came with a little <laughs> Huck Finn knapsack. You know, if we were going away, you and I, for 31 days, we'd probably check two or three bags. Oh, absolutely. And that was one of the things that I recognized right away. I made a little mental note like, wow, simplicity. It's pretty interesting. 
you know, I, at the end of our journey, I wanted everything he had, which was simplicity, which was freedom, which is a lot, which was his toughness and his grit. But I didn't want to give up what I had. So I still try to marry a lot of his principles and weave it into my current lifestyle. And I know that he was also, for lack of better words here, he was just all in with your family. I know he was a protector of your family. He was always scouting out for threats and, and possibilities of things that could come uh, could come y'all's way. I mean, you you had to feel pretty safe, I guess, with him there. And I mean, at first he was a stranger, right? Coming into your home, you didn't know anything about him. But then he became like family and really kind of helped protect a lot of stuff while he was there. We did. I mean, he's an all-in guy. And part of his, one of the greatest assets he has is his ability to be present. So he was able to eliminate a lot of the you know, we all have arrows that come at us every day, right? Like emails, requests for lunch meetings. Hey, can you get this guy on your pocket? You probably get him all the time. He was able to eliminate that and be very focused in anything that he did. So he could truly give 120% to anything he was doing at that given moment. So when, as it relates to living with our family, he was so present, he was so part of it that, and I think this would have been true of anything he was doing, he was giving 100% of his energy towards making sure that we were comfortable. We felt, you know, safe. By the way, I felt, I never felt safer in my life. I mean, I could leave my front door open. I almost want someone to come in. Uh, right. Have to deal with him. So, yeah, I think you had to go convince Sarah that y'all had to get like a new alarm system and bulletproof glass and all the stuff on the house. Right. I love that part of the book. Right. But I felt super comfortable with him. And I, Rightfully so. That's awesome. And he followed you everywhere. I mean, he, I don't know, at one point you had to go tell him like, hey man, we can't, we can't work out today. I, I've got to go on this meeting. He goes to the meeting and Kevin Garnett sits in the meeting and he's more captivated by Seal than even like talking about the business deal. Yeah, I mean, he had an amazing presence. I think there's a fascination with Navy Seals as it is, but he had an amazing presence. And when we went to, to meet with Garnett, I was trying to, at the time I was, just getting started with a venture called Zico Coconut Water, a new coconut water before the coconut water craze took off. And we wanted to bring some endorsers and visibility to the product. And Garnett was a guy that was high on the radar because he had been a Gatorade endorser. And this product was kind of like nature's version of Gatorade. And we thought if we could get Garnett to maybe switch teams as his contract with Gatorade was coming to a close or was over, then that would be a great victory for us and bring a lot of exposure and especially for a, a small little basically startup. So we, we flew out, I flew out to meet Garnett and Goggins came with me because he came everywhere with me. And when we got to the meeting, you know, immediately they engaged in almost like an arm, a mental arm wrestle. Goggins was asking him about his training. Garnett was asking Goggins about his training. And they just got into a really intense conversation for an hour or two. And I'm just sitting there twiddling my thumbs. Yeah. Forget Jesse's even in the room. Yeah. And then Garnett got up. He's like, all right, I got to get out of here. And I'm like, well, what about Zico? What I came to talk about. And he just said, listen, whatever you guys are in, I'm in. <laughs> nice. And that was it. So I'm like, I want to set up as many meetings as I can in 30 days to bring him with me. <laughs> yeah. That's get a right. Lot of work done. That's right. Jesse, what would you say is your non-negotiable and, and how has that changed since David came and lived with you guys? Non-negotiable as it relates to what? To As it relates to anything in life, just something that you will not budge on, whether it's routine, whether it's mental focus, just anything that you've got that makes you better in life that you're like, I, I will not budge on this because it'll take away from the point that I've grown to. Well, I try to live my life with a lot of non-negotiables and just try to, you know, set good examples for my kids. Obviously, like anybody. I have weaknesses. One thing that I'm very passionate about that's non-negotiable for me is food. I've only eaten fruit until 12 o'clock noon for 27 years with a handful of exceptions. Handful. So that's something that is sort of non-negotiable. I read a book called Fit for Life by Harvey Diamond in the late 80s uh, that changed my life for the better. That's a great book. That's been something that's been, you know, non-negotiable for me. I try to get my runs in every single day as much as, or, or some kind of workout in my balance with my family, you know, all my family stuff is non-negotiable as far as things that would take away from time if I can avoid it. So I have like my little kind of grouping of non-negotiables, but it's all around doing the right, you know, it's all around nothing crazy, unusual, nothing crazy, unusual, 
but just fruit until noon every day. So if I said, hey, let's go grab some banana pancakes at yeah. Atlanta's best you said, breakfast place. If you said to me, meet me tomorrow and we're going to have bacon and eggs at seven o'clock and then smoke a cigar, that would be a, we wouldn't be meeting. Jesse, for those out there listening, Sarah, wildly successful with Spanx and probably some other business ventures I don't even know about that she's out there in. You, part owner of the Atlanta Hawks now, working with all the Living with a Seal book stuff and, and everything that you're doing and traveling around, and then the 100 Mile Man stuff as well. How do you guys make it work? I know that's a very loaded question, right? Because there's so many facets to your life of just trying to make it work. Well, for starters, it's not easy. I think the most important thing is being able and having the freedom to say no. So not saying, again, there's, a, there's going back to those arrows. Hey, Jess, will you uh, meet for 20 minutes? Someone wants to pick your brain about this idea. Or can you have lunch with so-and-so? He's coming in and wanted to get a better understanding of this thing. That, those hours and minutes add up. And that's when you eliminate those, it frees up the time to spend with your family. So for me, and I think Sarah would be, the, would be the same if you asked her. I did a very simple pie chart of my time. It's been very helpful for me. I just drew a circle and I said, okay, boom, I carved off a little triangle that for seven hours of sleep, because seven of the 24 hours in a day, I, I need to sleep. That's my, that's where I like to be. Of course, I, some days are six, some days are four with the kids, some days are eight, but seven is a number. And then I take three hours a day for me to do because I don't want to resent my wife or anybody or work or anything for taking away things that I like to do. Running, it could be sitting on a couch and reading emails, sauna, whatever. But those hours are mine. And then I work like a typical work week, 40 hours. Most Americans work 40 hours, eight hours a day. So three for sleep, seven for my, uh, seven for sleep, three for me, eight for work. I still have six hours left. If I don't take those meetings, if I don't get caught down in, in, you know, emails and stuff that are meaningless. I have six hours left and I've taken three for me and worked a full day and slept to spend with my family, my kids. Now, obviously you have to eat, you have to commute, there's other stuff. My point is there's a lot of time when you don't dilly dally. And I think Sarah and I both, when we're in our three hour buckets, we're reading, Sarah likes to read, you know, the, the magazines or whatever. If I'm running, that's our time. But in the other time, when we're in the six hour bucket, that's family time and we're pretty present or try to be. And that lends to decent balance, but it's always a work in progress. Absolutely. That's a huge lesson I learned from a, a book called The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. If any of you guys haven't checked that out, he just talks about, just breaks it down like you did. Just there's so many hours in the day. Now it doesn't feel like that when we're going through it. We're running our busy offices and businesses and commuting and all the things, you know, it feels like there's not hardly any time in the day. But I think if you're intentional, your point is be intentional about it. I was actually going to ask you about your pie chart. I'd heard about, heard about that before, but yeah. you, you went ahead and hit it, just sectioning off times during the day. And I was also going to ask how much sleep are you getting each night? Because that's been a real struggle for me. It sounds like seven. Are you hitting those three hours during the day pretty consistently and your seven hours at night pretty consistently? Yeah. I mean, the asterisks there are my kids because every given, every night is, is a roll of the dice if I'm getting up in the middle of the night, but I try to get six to seven hours. Gotcha. And as we get ready to wrap up the podcast here, so appreciative of your time. One of the questions that I typically always ask people or try to squeeze in there somewhere is what their definition of success is. And I think uh, when you were hanging out with my, my man, Lewis Howells, I think you guys already covered this. And I heard your response that I, I'd never heard a response like this. And it just meant so much to me having, having kiddos myself. But you said something along the lines of that the definition of success is when your kids want to hang out with you when they're adults. I'd never heard that before. I don't know if you came up with that or you got that from somewhere, but that, I mean, that just kind of hit a heart chord for me because that's just something you, you want to be very successful parents on a lot of levels. But if your kids are hanging out with you when they're adults, you can kind of look back and go, man, I, I did some things right. That's pretty awesome. Is that, is that still kind of what you would say your definition of success would be something along those Definitely lines? Definitely one of them. You know, raising kids is a really hard thing. There's no manual. I'm always asking other friends that are parents for best practices. I ask my parents all the time how they did it for kids. And I do think that, you know, when you look back at your life, if you have kids, that's a great indicator. I mean, what would be, what could possibly be a greater ind indicator of having lived a successful life than having your adult kids want to be around you? Absolutely. Now that's not mine. I got one of my friends told me that when we were talking about it, my friend, David Moore, and it really, it really resonated with me. 
And of course, there's a lot of different ways to measure success and everybody has their own interpretation. Everyone's scorecard is different. It's all different. It's all over the board. But I think that's one really good, a real good way to look at it. Happiness, daily happiness. There's so many ways to measure it. Well, I'll tell you, that's the best answer I've ever heard because it does mean, I mean, you can make tons of money and be miserable, right? I mean, we all know oh, people like that. Not even, I mean, money is great. It just, you know, makes your life, money's the magnifier, right? It just makes you, if you're a good guy, a better guy or a bad guy, a worse guy, charitable person, more charitable. It's just a magnifying glass, but it's not, it doesn't correlate to success at all. I mean, Absolutely. financial success you could, is easy to grade, but that doesn't mean that's low. Yeah, that, and that's where most people's mind goes on that success question is straight to profitability, money. But there's, I mean, there's so much more than that. And I've loved that answer. It was the best one that I've heard. So Jesse, thanks so much for your time here today. We really appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy. Let me steer more traffic your way, especially to the book and the other uh, ventures that you have going on right now. Where can my listeners best connect with you and find you and even find out more about the book? Great. Well, I'm at uh, on Instagram and Twitter at the 100, number 100 mile man. And the 100mileman.com is the best place to get me. But I appreciate it very much for having me on. And I'm glad we got to spend the time. Absolutely, man. Keep doing what you're doing out there. And uh, hopefully the Hawks are, are have a good season and, and all that. I'll be thinking about you whenever I'm watching them. But, uh, man, thanks so much for all you do. And just for, number one, just showing us that uh, you don't have to have a ton of experience. If you have a dream and you have a vision, you can go create a lot of, of things. And then just bringing the mental aspect into that as well. And I just, I cannot tell you guys as listeners enough, if there's anything that you do in the form of, uh, of getting a book, whether it's hard copy, audio book, whatever, go get Living with a seal great great book like i said i'm on my third time through it already and i just pick up a lot of nuggets in there so thanks so much for what you're doing and for giving your time here today we appreciate it pleasure take care okay bye-bye Hey guys, if you've enjoyed the Success 101 podcast, head over to iTunes and give it a five-star rating and even a review. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that and also share it with friends, family, business partners, anyone that you feel might benefit from reaching higher levels of peak performance and reaching their maximum potential each day. If you're looking to connect with me, the easiest way to do that is my email, which is info at success 101 podcast, or you can find me on many platforms of social media, including Facebook at facebook.com slash success 101 podcast on Twitter at Warren Jared or on Instagram, my favorite form of social media at Jared underscore Warren. I loved having Jesse here on the podcast today, and I'll catch you guys on another episode of the Success 101 podcast. Until then.